Hi, welcome to this video lecture about observation. My uh, cameraman just told me that I had to climb this tree because in Africa, for people to observe uh, properly, they climb trees. For example, when they want to see a parade or a football match or politics, they climb into high trees to be able to observe properly the, the situation. Now, for research, for action research, I wouldn't really advise you to climb trees. Although, I have to say that when you climb a tree, people will not notice you observing and that actually adds to uh, the validity of your research. But I'm not sure if I should advise you to, uh, for you to climb trees. Rather, you ask people if you can sit down somewhere to, uh, to observe the surroundings. But yeah, it's a bit tricky but because sometimes in some situations people act differently if, if you're sitting there. But more about that later. Uh, in this video lecture about observation, I would like to explain you a bit more about uh, structured direct observation, uh, which is a form of observation where you actually choose a, a time and a setting to sit down and actually for a specific period of time watch closely, for example, human behavior. And observation is one of the most important research methods when you're doing uh, participatory research because. The things that you hear during interviews don't always reflect what you see. So what you hear during interviews should be cross-checked. And one of the ways to cross-check your data is by using observation. To me, observation is a bit of an underestimated uh, research method because it actually is very powerful. It is there during basically all the research methods because during interviewing you, you observe uh, the expressions of the participants, during transects you look around, uh, during uh, photo elicitation you observe the pictures as well to be able to analyze them. So basically observation is always there. But observation can also be a method on its own. And the independent method observation is the one that we're going to describe in this video lecture. You can use observation combined with other research methods or you can use observation on itself. You can for example uh, observe surroundings during the transect walk or during interviews. Observation is used to, uh, to see non-verbal communication. During focus groups you observe group dynamics and non-verbal communication. And during photo and video elicitation, you observe, of course, the, the photos and videos to see uh, preferences, behavior, etc. And in context immersion is a, a, a method in which the researcher lives and works with the community members to literally see social life through their eyes. And so there are many, many research methods in which observation is a very important method. You can, of course, also use observation as a method on itself. There's many, many different typologies of observation, but in this video lecture, I'm just going to make a very rough distinction between structured and unstructured observation. In unstructured observation, there are a few main types of unstructured observation. First, for example, in participant observation, the researcher immerses him or herself in a social setting for a lengthy period of time and gathers information through observation and asking questions. Naturalistic observation is observation carried out in real-world settings to create a systemic, encompassing, integrated overview of the context and the researcher tries to acquire an empathetic understanding of the situation as perceived by the local actors, as if from the inside. And there's narrative methods they are used to tell the story of what is happening in a given situation. Structured observations are focused. They look selectively at social phenomena and can be used to test the hypothesis or to make a baseline. But why would we make a baseline? Let's see. Because when you're doing a project, you want to measure afterwards if the project has done anything good. So, in order to measure the difference, you could do observation. For example, you observe how the situation is beforehand and you make it measurable 
so that afterwards, maybe a few years after the project, you can go back again and observe the same situation again and see what has changed. And I will show you this type of observation by going to a school and observe the children in class. So let's show you how I do it. So I'm going to focus in this observation video lecture on concentration to create a baseline. But how can we measure concentration? Is it by the amount of times children do not look at the teacher? By the amount of times children talk to each other? Or by the number of incidents of antisocial behavior among them? That is something you want to consider beforehand. For example, with their teacher or other local stakeholders. What do they perceive as concentration? Write everything down for analysis of your observation later on. Do this a few times for a specific set of minutes or focus on each observation item separately so that you don't have too much running at the same time. Or even do the observation with an extra observer so that you can both focus on other phenomena. It's quite a busy task to do to have several observation items in one observation moment. So carefully choose how to do it. Now, of course, you want to be able to analyze your observation results. So when you're doing observation, you may already want to think of how to be able to compare the results. So for example, you can make tables. There's several tables you can make, and it depends, of course, on what type of outcome you want to, to get. So let's give you a, a few examples. Uh, to start with, you can do uh, event sampling. Let me draw that for you. you. Draw, for example, a table with two columns. And in the left column, you put observation. And then in the right, you put the number of times that event happens. So for example, we go back to the, to the classroom and we're going to see uh, how uh, concentration is measured. So you use a few items to measure concentration and one of them could be how often do the children uh, look away from the teacher. So you write down look away from teacher and you're going to just write down the number of times a child looks away from the teacher. So you put here maybe four times and then you have another time uh, item that you're going to count as well and just for all these items you count during your observation how often that event happens. So event sampling is basically what you do when the chronological order is not important but when it is important you can do for example time sampling. So what you do is you draw a new table and you're going to make lots of columns and a few rows depending on the amount of items that you want to measure. So left observation again, and then you put one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. You put the items again in the left column, and then you can, for example, write down after how many seconds or how many minutes the first event happens. So you put here, for example, after 30 seconds, and the second time that that event happens is after 80 seconds, after 10 minutes, maybe, let's see. So that's how you can uh, measure items in a chronological order, and that's called time sampling. Now, when you, as a researcher, have to make a judgment of a certain observation, you can draw a different table, and that is called a rating scale. So, for example, let's take a rating of uh, low, medium, and high. So you draw low, medium, and high of some sort of observation. And then you draw again the rows for the items that you're going to observe. And then you can fill in if an item occurs low, medium or high. So that's a uh, rating scale. And so you see that there are several ways of, uh, of how to uh, put your observation, uh, observations into comparable or measurable tables that you can use later on in, during your analysis stage. So let's talk about the full procedure from beginning to the end. As a preparation, you may want to address a few questions before you start. First of all, 
what questions do you want your observation to answer? Second, where and whom are you going to observe? And third, when and for how long is your observation going to take place? Then it's time to find gatekeepers. And gatekeepers are those people who control access to the site. For example, village leaders or uh, council members. Ask their permission for your observation before you can actually go sit there to observe. And then it's time for your observation method and make sure that during uh, your observation you have an open and non-judgmental attitude and also make sure you dress decent. Don't forget to keep notes and make sure that they are suitable for analysis later on. And when you've done your analysis, it's time to draw your conclusions from the observation method. Then let's go to the advantages of observation methods. Observation, like I said, is a very good cross-checker of other research methods and it increases the validity of your data. Also, it allows the researcher closest to, closer to the essential truth about social life. And last, it provides very rich data, for example, on behaviors, intentions, situations, e events, nonverbal communication, etc. Unfortunately, there's also some disadvantages of the observation method. First of all, misconceptions of your purpose are quite common and you may present yourself as a researcher who would like to learn from them about the challenges on a specific topic uh, and how people deal with such challenges, for example. But sometimes people interpret that as you are sent by the government to help them or that you're going to come to give money to them, etc. So misconceptions are quite common and you need to think very carefully of how you're going to present yourself as an observer in their community. Then different researchers gain different understandings of what they observe. Everybody observes something differently or interpret their observations differently. It's something natural, but can be quite a disadvantage in observation. And you can eliminate that by discussing with different researchers how they would interpret that observation you made. Male and female researchers have access to different information. There are some places where um, male researchers are disadvantaged and in other sites female researchers will get less information than men. So it quite matters if you're a male or a female depending on what kind of information you are looking for. Then there's also a number of things that affect whether the researcher is accepted in the community or not, including one's physical appearance, ethnicity, age, gender, class, etc. And last but not least important, the appearance of a researcher in the observation area may alter real life. People may act differently when they see that there's someone observing them.